up in New York City um, with a family of uh, pretty gritty, tough characters. Uh, uh, my father was a New York City fireman, and uh, my mother was a uh, uh, teaching assistant, and uh, the family that we lived with and were close by were my uncles were merchant mariners and beat cops, and um, uh, these were individuals who had been all baptized in the Depression and uh, were, I think, stoic about being sick or in pain or having not having much in the way of money. Uh, they seemed to deal with it very well. and. Uh, Though, uh, though I think I realized, and I guess it was the second, first or second big lesson that I learned, was that uh, being a stoic, um, uncomplaining person uh, didn't protect you from disease or illness. Uh, my father, uh, as, as, tough, as tough a guy as he was, and he was, but not at home, uh, you know, uh, suffered from the consequences of breathing uh, smoke from industrial fires and became very ill. And uh, uh, in those days, firemen didn't uh, have oxygen. They were called smoke eaters because they ate smoke. And uh, he suffered from that. And um, my aunt uh, was, uh, became schizophrenic. And, my favorite uncle uh, developed an ankylosing spine, was in great pain all the time. And what I saw was the ac absolute pitiful uh, attempts at therapeutic intervention. And uh, I think that created in me a desire to um, pursue an education uh, that was clinically relevant. I should also say that uh, as, uh, as stoic as these people were, they were um, very open to uh, spending resources, whatever we had, on uh, sick dogs and cats. They, uh, uh, the vet would always be called, no matter the, the financial situation. and. Um, uh, we were meat eaters, and uh, so that notion of concern for domestic animals and who were members of the family and how that uh, played out in terms of our diets was uh, something that was never coherently bridged. Um, so I think uh, that that combination of uh, issues of uh, you know seeing. What, what can happen to people and how little there was available medically and uh, the solid and important place that at least domestic animals had in our family life. Uh, it's a very crucial foundation. I left New York to go to uh, Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas, and uh, why? That's, it's, uh, I still wonder about it, but uh, I'd never been further west than the New Jersey Palisades, actually. And uh, I went, uh, I wanted to leave New York, quite frankly, and I think uh, I was open for new experiences and living in another place and, you know, very different than the one I grew up in. And I had some <clears throat> uh, minor dream, <clears throat> excuse me, minor dream about becoming a, a, a collegiate football player which thankfully uh, never emerged, got injured too quick. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was an interesting place, Texas Tech. Uh, I, I gravitated because of my interest in mental illness and neurological illness uh, to the psychology department and the biology department. And um, it was, um, again, this is uh, the mid-1960s. and. Uh, I was uh, completely captured by the lectures I would hear in my psych particularly in my psychology courses about um, experimental psychology and uh, 
what it could possibly do for people and even even to the point of like conceptualizing altering culture and so on and so forth people had very big ideas about what was ahead for psychologically sophisticated people but one other thing that i saw was uh from my, when my from my professors uh, a very de de uh, degraded view of clinic clinicians operating in the medical field and the psychological field they uh, they were likened uh, to people who were just really know nothings they were just guessing at at what to do i remember one professor of mine uh, likening uh, psychiatry and clinical psychology to um, a um, a TV repairman who comes to your house but to fix your TV but doesn't know a thing about electricity and takes a hammer and bangs on the side of the the the, uh, the TV set and uh, occasionally something rattles back into place and your your the picture reemerged. So this was a this was a very strident picture that was made of. Uh, the clinical world at that time, at least. And what the answer was, uh, was uh, animal models, simple models of various kinds of disease processes um, where, quote, real science could be done. And uh, I, I was very impressed by that. And uh, I quickly became involved in, in laboratories and working with human researchers and animal researchers and um, well that was uh, I ran into something there that was very important uh, was there was also a sense that a a rigorous science was a ruthless science and I mean ruthless in the sense of one had to learn how to tolerate uh, the consequences of experimentation, particularly with animals, um, in order to uh, achieve. I mean, I think there was an, uh, a recognition that many of our techniques were crude and, and uh, untutored, uh, but that was something that had to be tolerated, you know, because there was such an urgency to, uh, to discover to learn and to uh, um, push forward. So, um, and so I had a, as I said earlier, you know, kind of growing up, uh, learning, learning how to to be affectionate and love and respect animals, which was a big part of my life uh, as a child, and uh, learning to be indifferent uh, to a certain extent, at least. Uh, was hard for me um, because those you know I, I in my household we I, our grandparents lived my grandparents lived with us and they never liked me I know they didn't like me I think they were just the house was too crowded the apartment was too crowded it was you know they didn't have time for us but the one thing my grandmother the only thing I can remember her purposely trying to teach me was to show kindness to the ragman's horse. It, it was like it meant so much to her that she teach me about that. And so as a, as a researcher, I had to find a way to back off and uh, not look so closely, perhaps. And... Um, it was initially hard, and uh, uh, very hard. I had worked primarily with uh, rodents as an undergraduate, and there was a, a strong motive in those days, in the uh, uh, 1960s, uh, that modern psychology needed to uh, start studying different kinds of animal species and that the rodent, uh, though useful, uh, was uh, more or less a dead end. 
and uh, we were encouraged to try to go to laboratories where other animals would be available, like non-human primates. So I, so I wrote a letter to uh, uh, Harry F. Harlow at Wisconsin, and uh, <clears throat> asked him if uh, he'd be interested in a graduate student. And uh, he, amazingly, he wrote back uh, and uh, said, "Well." Well, let's try an internship first. And so uh, he offered me a, an internship, a summer internship, three-month internship. And I went, and uh, I remember he made it perfectly clear to me that uh, he would pay me half time, but I would be expected to work time and a half at least. And uh, I liked that because it was like he was demonstrating the importance of science and also the lesson that uh, as a student, you were a student full time and everything else was secondary. So I went to uh, Wisconsin, did the internship and uh, uh, eventually got a, 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 an offer from uh, Gene Sackett who was at the, the Harlow lab uh, as my primary mentor at that moment, at that time. Uh, uh, Jim Sackett left, New Me uh, left uh, the University of Wisconsin and then Harlow picked me up at that point. Um, yeah, I think trying to describe the, uh, the uh, uh, Wisconsin Primate Laboratory, Harlow's laboratory and how things were done and uh, what was done and uh, it's 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 like most things, a pretty complex story. Uh, the 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 areas that, of course, he was interested in primarily were um, uh, brain lesion studies, uh, the process of learning in non-human primates, and uh, social development. Uh, those were the three areas. And um, uh, as a as an advisor, he demanded nothing in terms of uh, an agreement to study this or that or in any of those three areas. You were totally on your own. If you wanted to, you could pursue research in the areas that were primarily his interest, or you could not, or you need not. And um, though I think most of us did, uh, because we felt that that was, uh, uh, well, he was, he was showing us the uh, important directions, at least that's how we saw it. and. Uh, he, it was like taking his advice to agree to do the work. And so what I did was I worked in kind of a, a combination area of the effects of early environment on uh, learning. That was the area that I chose to work in. And so I worked primarily with uh, groups of, of monkeys who, some of which had been raised in total social isolation from uh, day one of their lives to um, six, nine, or 12 months for that period of time and then released from that. Or I worked with animals that were um, exposed and uh, raised and uh, exposed to more or less normal kind, quote, normal social experiences as they developed over the first year of life with mothers and peers and so on. And uh, so that was, those were the natural comparison groups uh, to look at uh, what were the intellectual consequences of those, of those uh, differential experiences. Um, I should also say, though, uh, the lab was um, very different than the lab I was in, in at uh, uh, Texas Tech University. It, it, there were many... Uh, I think four veterinarians that were there. There was a, a trained care staff that uh, uh, were as professional as you could develop at that point in uh, history. Um, he had, uh, Harlow had professional testers, that is, who worked off of their grants, his grants, and uh, were not students. Um, there were statisticians, there were electricians, there were metal shops. Uh, so if you needed to build equipment, 
there was the material to do it. Uh, you went to the shop, and had it done, and if you were interested in learning how to do it, they would teach you. And, uh, and uh, the veterinarians were there, and they were very attentive. Uh, I would say that almost, except for those monkeys that were being raised with social experience for a reason, experimental reason, uh, all the rest lived in individual cages. And, uh, and as a consequence, would develop you know, various kinds of diseases from that situation. And there were many veterinarians to do that work. And they were good models about how to do it and how to recognize illness and so on. The only socially housed monkeys that were in the lab were there if that was a particular experiment that was being done. And um, uh, Harlow's uh, wife, Margaret Keeney Harlow, uh, was very interested in uh, uh, the effects of infants growing up with close contact with uh, males. And so she had a, a, what she called a nuclear family uh, apparatus, which involved uh, intense social experience uh, and uh, close contact with uh, adult males. So again, you know, um, that was the reason they would be socially uh, uh, housed, uh, for experimental reasons only. I think the individual cage housing uh, was a, a development uh, of a tradition that that's the way monkeys were housed, uh, and that uh, it made it simpler. You know, you had easier access. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, they, uh, they did well on the surface. I mean, if you looked at them and, you know, they were alert and uh, well-nourished. And uh, uh, so there wasn't a lot of thought that, uh, that this was something we ought to change, uh, even though the results of the studies that uh, Harlow did on the effects of social limitation uh, illustrated, you know, many devastating consequences in uh, social behavior, and we showed intellectual consequences as well. Well, you know, Harry was a, was a very interesting person in this regard, at least. Um, he would say things uh, for the purpose of stunning the listener. And the listener could be a, a broad audience. And I honestly believe that a lot of things that he would say, you know, like, uh, I hate monkeys, I don't like dogs, uh, you know, I, I, I frankly never believed any of it. I thought it was done for effect. Um, Though I should say I, I never, I never saw him uh, uh, show any express concern for the monkeys uh, that that uh, were in some of his experiments. Uh, but then again, you know, he wasn't with them. I mean, he was the he was the head of this very large laboratory, and I he, at least in the in the in the time period that I knew him, he didn't have any direct contact with monkeys. All that work was done by his. Uh, employed staff who, uh, who loved him. Uh, you know, I know people throw the term that, it, you know, places being family oriented and whatever. Well, the Wisconsin lab that Harry created was indeed a family. And uh, people treated one another that way. There was tremendous respect for him. He was uh, the paternal force who protected us and uh, protected us from uh, getting uh, uh, drafted into Vietnam and, and uh, protected us from the horrible Department of Psychology where one in five people graduated. And, and uh, he was a great protector for that. Well, in addition, he also got you jobs. That's where the, how it worked. So more or less, uh, one day he says, uh, comes to me, and uh, John Davenport, who was another one of his associates, came to me, and they said, well, uh, there's, a, there's a job at the University of New Mexico, and um, you should go there. And Harry added that he'd had a student there already, uh, and that student had decided to leave academia, 
and uh, he thought it was my job to go uh, to take that position that was uh, left open from his previous student. And so, uh, but the, the family attribute, okay, so here, I, here I, I get this invitation for an interview. I mean, it's, I'm embarrassed to say it, it was the old boy network. It was Harry Harlow calling Frank Logan in, in, in New Mexico or vice versa, and who do you have, Harry? And, and, uh, but there was at least, you know, you, you, you just didn't walk in, you had to have a, an interview. So in preparing for the interview, um, uh, the husband of uh, one of the professional researchers uh, Ken Stanick, who was a uh, uh, worked in a men's store, uh, came to me and said, "Well, this is what you have to wear." And uh, so I went to the store, and he picked out my shirts and my uh, ties and uh, my pants. And uh, uh, the uh, person in charge of the uh, photographic unit uh, came to me and said, "You know, with a beautiful little box of." Uh, that we could put slides in, and he made selected all the slides that he thought would be appropriate, and handed those to me. And uh, uh, you know, and ev everybody listened to, to your you know talk uh, forty times while you practiced it, and and uh, uh, there was a lot of concern for how this was going to work. So. Uh, so it was, I guess, my job to lose, and I didn't lose it. <laughs> well, this is another part of the Wisconsin story about what I did at New Mexico and uh, the connection there. Uh, before, and this would be any student, before any student left, uh, you met with Harry, and Harry would reach across the desk and hand you the key, the key. The key was to the storeroom. And in this very, very large cavernous storeroom were everything a person would need to start uh, a laboratory. Caging, uh, equipment of various types, and uh, um, holding equipment. Uh, it was all there. Catching nets. And uh, the, the uh, agreement was you just took what you needed. And, uh, and he shipped it to you. So you tagged it, and uh, so I sh and and then you you said what monkeys you wanted, and I wanted to take the monkeys that I had been working on for my uh, master's and my PhD dissertation, <clears throat> and uh, so I go to New Mexico, and uh, New Mexico's uh, building, their new site building, was in the process of being built. It wasn't built. Um, and so I had to start a lab in the chemistry department till that was completed. And Harry just, you know, here comes the, uh, the moving van with all the equipment. And uh, so I set up my lab in the, in the chemistry department. And then a month later, the monkeys showed up. And uh, it was like I picked up immediately studying uh, effects of early environment uh, on learning almost without, a, without a, a much of a brief period of stop at all. And so I continued that work for uh, uh, many years. I also added uh, doing work on the effects of, of uh, drugs on learning and, and uh, with uh, monkeys that, none, that, that Harry hadn't sent, but that we purchased with uh, my colleague, uh, Douglas Ferraro. And uh, so I did mostly, I continued my work and got into the effects of drug, drugs and behavior, and uh, uh, that was the nucleus of the work. Visiting the uh, Holloman Air Force Base um, chimpanzee facility, which occurred, I think, uh, just a couple years after I was there at University of New Mexico, was one of those kind of uh, uh, shaky uh, experiences. and. Uh, <clears throat> the head veterinarian at New Mexico uh, had been a, a veterinarian in the Air Force and had worked on the worked with the chimps down in Holloman as part of the NASA 
chimps in space, Mercury Project. And so he, had, he knew the people there, and he invited uh, his new veterinarian colleague, a man named Brett Snyder, who became a very important person to me, and me to visit Holloman. And so we drove the 300 or whatever it is miles down to Holloman Air Force Base. And, and uh, I didn't know what I was prepared to see. Um, I mean, after all, I was somebody uh, uh, who had monkeys in individual cages and, and uh, uh, pretty restricted environments and so on in itself. And But I guess I just didn't know what to expect. So we went into some of the holding areas at Holloman, and uh, I would say, you know, they were all clean and, and uh, looked like all the foods that then fruits they were s serving as uh, nutritional supplements. The animals all were uh, excellent quality. And, but seeing these chimps in these, and they, they ha it had to be modeled after a, a high security, maximum security environment. Uh, it was dark. It was uh, the shouting, you know, just uh, from the from the chimps, just uh, uh, reverberated through the small spaces, and uh, and of course they were big and menacing, and they were no, they were no longer, you know, two year olds that could be wrestled into spacesuits uh, for the practice of the Mercury Project. These were all full adults, males. 180, 200 pounds, and uh, females probably not too much smaller, and they were frightening, and they seemed um, bereft to me. They uh, they were either furious or they were depressed. That's the way. It, that's the way it appeared to me, and th there was a line down the middle of this, these holding facilities that would have chimps on either side. And the line was that you walk down that line because that line was, would more or less keep you out of range of being hit with feces or being spit at or, and, 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 it, and it soiling your clothes. So, uh, I mean, looking back on it, I imagine that was probably some of the most enjoyable things that the chimps had to do. Um, and um, uh, Phil Day, who was the uh, our contact there, uh, obviously he was very used to all of this because he'd worked in that context uh, as a as a veterinarian in the Air Force. But this other vet, uh, Brett Snyder, and I, we would I would notice we would keep catching one another's eye during this like. You know, do a little grimace at one another. Like, is this is this real somehow? And um, I I know uh, I I've made significant changes in my life about thinking about animals and ethics, but it definitely wasn't like Paul on the road to Damascus. But this was one of those early lead-in. Uh, little cracks like, I wonder if people walk through my laboratory, they would have a reaction like I was having to seeing those chimps. Well, I, uh, I think in, in talking about what, how inspecting facilities of other laboratories uh, impacted me, um, I think uh, an important case in point was uh, visiting the dog labs at the uh, uh, School of Medicine. Well, I, I'd been appointed by the chair of the department to be on this, uh, this animal inspection committee. This was pre-Iacook, uh, and, uh, but that we, we were uh, given the responsibility to, you know, look at animal facilities and report back to the, the, the uh, vice president for research about conditions and so on and so forth. And uh, um, I discovered that I couldn't go into the uh, dog labs. Uh, I, I mean, I made the initial 
couple of uh, inspections with colleagues, and we would go into the dog labs, and, and uh, there were no runs, uh, as you might find today. But the dogs were in fairly large cages, stacked too high in these rooms, and uh, they were used in educational uh, uh, topics, for educational topics like uh, cardiac physiology laboratories, and they were also uh, heavily used in uh, uh, cardiac uh, studies. So you'd walk through these, uh, these, again, manicured cage environments, and, and here were these dogs that, you know, that would um, scratch on the side of, the, of their cages and bark and, uh, you know, no doubt trying to get somebody to, to lay a hand on them. And, uh, and seeing these very long suture lines down their chest and so on, um, it was just, uh, it was such an uncomfortable experience. I felt such uh, pity for uh, what I was seeing, though I would have at the same time said I respected the people who were doing the research and the educational uh, events that they participated in. I would have thought that they were probably necessary. I changed my view about that. but uh, So I would come up with a, every time we did one of these tours, I would come up with a, an excuse for why I wouldn't go into the dog rooms. Uh, nobody questioned me about it. Uh, but I think that that's, you know, a classic case of manipulating indifference, you know. Don't want to look, don't go in. And uh, so I didn't. An important example about uh, looking at um, the conditions of animals in the research facility in the department where I was at New Mexico, because I'd had this responsibility thrust on me to be in charge of that whole facility. And uh, so one of the uh, a uh, student assistant caretakers uh, came to my office one day and said, uh, I want you to see this. And so I went up, followed him up into the labs and went into a rat room and, and he pulled out a cage drawer and there was uh, an albino rat, uh, cold and dead. Uh, not an unusual uh, thing to see in a laboratory like that. Uh, but then he, he pointed to, to the data book that was next to this rack of, of uh, rats. And um, he said, he pointed for me, read this. He would say, read this. And so I look at it and I, I look at the number of the rat and I find the rat's number on the on the data sheet and and he and he's being so insistent with me read the data and it was weight data you know and uh, that was taken on a daily basis and uh, it was obvious that this was a rat that was on a deprivation schedule to prepare it for some learning studies <clears throat> and again it was a tradition in those days to reduce rats to uh, 80 percent of their free feeding weight uh, to prep them, as it were, for uh, reward-induced learning studies. So they'd be more accepting of the, the uh, sucrose tablets or uh, little treats they would get for running mazes or in operant conditioning studies. And so we tracked down uh, the line of weights over the course of uh, a week or so. and. Uh, the rate at which this person had reduced this animal's weight was uh, incredible, um, to the point where you, you know, here's a rat losing 20% of its total body weight in basically just a few days. And uh, I, I, it was probably six or seven days. And uh, it was at such a rate that uh, the animal died. And this, uh, this student, this untutored student, was enraged about it. 
and uh, I got enraged too. I never would have seen it uh, had not this person uh, pointed it out to me. And it, again, it impacted me on uh, the notion of, you know, these traditional ways that we did things. In, in laboratories and learning studies, you know, reduce the animal by this much and of course do it as quickly as possible so you don't waste any time and so on. I, I, I'm, sh I'm sure it wasn't done with like, uh, let's make this rat suffer be and make it feel like it's starving. I'm sure that wasn't anybody's intention in this, but uh, uh, how somebody might think you could produce anything but that in the uh, uh, using this particular procedure is beyond me. But then, of course, we didn't talk much about what rats felt. Uh, in fact, we studiously avoided it. We trained to describe animals from the outside. Uh, we were, in a sense, not permitted to use words like the rat is hungry, thirsty, frightened. Uh, it was all using uh, descriptive uh, terms, operational descriptions. Well, we didn't talk about hunger. We talked about how long it had been since the animal ate last. Um, we didn't talk about thirst. We talked about how many, when was the last time water was available to it. So this was, uh, you know, the classic Watsonian, Skinnerian, behavioristic tradition of let's not get inside the organism. And uh, I suppose there was some good reasons to do that, but it separated you, uh, fed your indifference to what the uh, phenomenological experience of that animal might be. Traditional procedures that we used in preparing animals, to, uh, monkeys, to be involved in learning studies um, led us uh, not to ask many questions about what the consequences of those traditional preparation procedures would be uh, and how they would impact the animals. Uh, and a very important, uh, I would say this would be as close to uh, Paul on the road to Damascus as anything that happened to me in my life. Um, this veterinarian that I mentioned to you, Brett Snyder, uh, well, I was consulting with them because I was trying to get monkeys to do this task where they'd be in a cage and there would be lights that they would have to track, you know, and and we wanted to, yeah, we wanted to study uh, short-term memory and the effects of drugs on short-term memory. And uh, the problem was the monkeys wouldn't do the task. You know, we could shape them up to a particular period of time up to a particular point, and then they would stop. They wouldn't, wouldn't work. And so I was decreasing their weight like that, uh, like a, any person would do in a situation like that. Well, they're not hungry. They're not motivated, as it were, to participate in the study. So you have to reduce their weight and make them a little hungrier, let them, you know, let them um, uh, find uh, a supplementary food while they were working in the experiment. And that was, well, it just wasn't working, and I kept on reducing these monkeys' weight a little bit at a time, and I called this veterinarian, Brett Snyder, who had recently joined <clears throat> the university staff. And I had, he came over, and, he's, and I said, well, I'm doing this deprivation reduction. <clears throat> it's not working. I want to do a little bit more of it. So <clears throat> I want you to teach me about what I should look at so I didn't repeat the problem with the rat I had seen starve to death. And uh, so I was asking for clinical information. What do I look for? You know, when, am I, when, am I, when have I gone too far? And so on and so forth. And, um, <clears throat> and he did help me with that. He developed a, a, a diagram that I could use to measure different uh, adipose points on a, on, on a, on a monkey's body. And, which would, and I, I could rate it and at what point it would appear that I'd gone too far or was approaching going too far. But the other thing he said to me was, um, he said, um, <clears throat> he said, let me, let me ask you this, Dr. Gluck. He was very uh, uh, careful about how he addressed me in this issue. And he said, let me ask you this question. What do you think happens 
when you have decreased this animal's weight to the point it would eat nails, if that's what you were serving it, don't you think that you have basically decorticated it? Is it still a monkey working at such a primitive level of motivation? <laughs> and uh, I thought, what a question. Again, traditional procedures blocking this kind of uh, more interpretive concern. And uh, he was right. I mean, what was, then he said to me, he said, don't you think there's nothing wrong with the monkey? There's something wrong with your test. He said, you're, he, don't you think you're presenting it a test? This test doesn't mean anything to a monkey cognitively. You, ca you have to come up with a test that means something to the monkey and who it is as a species. And, uh, and in this very professional and uh, way, he was telling me, you know, you don't know anything about monkeys, do you? They're, you know, you don't know about them except what their numbers are and that they're in the cages over there and, they, uh, and you use them. You don't really don't understand a monkey cognition, monkey cognition do you? Uh, this was a very powerful effect on me because uh, he was right. I didn't. Now, I would say Harry Harlow knew about monkey cognition because... He, he had developed a test apparatus in the 1940s called the Wisconsin General Test Apparatus that monkeys love to work in. I mean, they, they really did. Um, but, uh, yeah, that one had me on my heels. I don't think I ever got off my heels, actually, after that interaction. And I realized something about veterinarians, how important they were to have in the lab. But veterinarians like this guy Snyder, who would challenge you about what you were doing, not just make uh, a project go on, not just get, help you get over uh, you know, some infectious diseases that might be interfering with your research. That's important, of course. But he wouldn't limit himself to that kind of uh, job description. He did that, but he also felt that he had questions, experimental questions to, to ask about, that that was an important part of his job. And I'm sure lucky he felt that way. Well, another aspect of this, uh, this important person, uh, Brett Snyder, uh, in his veterinary role, um, there was a a project going on in the department that involved uh, self-infusion of uh, various drugs. So monkeys would have surgical, uh, have catheters implanted in their jugular veins, and that uh, catheter would be threaded through a, a, a plastic helmet that the animal wore, and so that the, the, uh, the catheter could be reached and attached to devices and that could time infusions of drugs and so on. And uh, I noticed that, uh, uh, and, and this wasn't a, a research project that I was directly involved in, but I was um, quite knowledgeable about it. And I noticed that the uh, veterinarian, Brett Snyder, was there a lot uh, dealing with catheter tract infections in these, um, in these monkey subjects. And then uh, one day coming to work, and going into the lab, I, I see all these graduate students, and they're all milling around, and they're speaking very loudly and, and uh, obviously very upset. And I, so I wedge myself into the conversation, and they said, and they, it's like, do you believe this? That SOB vet uh, just shut down that self-infusion project. And I said, really? And uh, I had never heard of a vet shutting down anything. You know, and uh, uh, and the students were really um, of two minds. Some were just 
infuriated that he would make a move like that. Who is he to disrupt this important research? But then there was, there were others who seemed to think, well, it's about time. Um, we all know that wasn't very good. That uh, it was tough on the monkeys and and people perhaps didn't know how to do the surgeries adequately and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and that certainly leads to the question, you know, I think most or many scientists, you know, will, t will tell you that self-regulation self is the way to go. You know, leave us alone. We know what we're doing. And, and we'll, if we don't, we'll, we'll ask for help and things will be fine. We don't need uh, university committees looking over our shoulders or, uh, or uh, NIH or uh, OLA coming or USDA investigating this. We don't need any of this. In fact, it's insulting. Um, well, I didn't, I mean, I think that made it perfectly clear that that wasn't the case because uh, many years later in talking to Brett Snyder, he uh, mentioned to me that he had he'd gotten a, a letter or, uh, or maybe it was a phone call from another of the faculty members in the, in the department who said, said to him, I'm certainly glad you did that because it was impossible for me to step forward to one of my senior colleagues and and criticize his work. Uh, it, I, I, he was saying I couldn't do it. He said, I know it, it looks like I'm chickening out here, but it just wouldn't have happened. You know, the, the dominant structure was such that you just found a way to ignore it. And uh, I thought, again, that was a, a very important lesson about the necessity of outside people not conflicted or involved in a social dynamic relationship, uh, trying to uh, provide judgments about the quality of work and the effectiveness of researchers' work and, and how thoughtful they can be. Yeah, well, that break-in that I uh, uh, experienced at that time in the, in the uh, mid uh, late 70s uh, it, it had a lot of a impact on me. Actually, you know, thinking about it, I think I know who did it now. Um, but nonetheless, show up one day and hear all the monkeys running around the lab and some of them fighting with one another and uh, inflicting bad wounds on one another. And they, they all had their canine teeth. And if you've ever looked at the size of the canine teeth on an adult rhesus monkey, uh, you will see the kind of injury that, that those monkeys can produce on another monkey or whomever. They have a, like a sharp knife-like edge down the back that they grind with their lower ones. And uh, so we struggled and got them all back in and stitched them up and so on and so forth. And there was the spray paint about uh, uh, letting animals go free and so on and so forth. And uh, the impact it had on me was, um, one, uh, I, I said, whoever did this is very brave. I mean, I would never have gone into a room or rooms with uh, the number of monkeys that were there and the kind of ferocious reaction that they would have to most strangers who would walk into a room. You would have to be a very brave person to then open those cages. But at the same time, you know, I felt, um, you know, um, I felt wronged, I felt vulnerable, I felt that the monkeys had suffered. Um, and if that experience had any effect on me, what it did was delay my appreciation for some of the ethical issues about their treatment. Uh, you know, and it, it, kind of a, a defensive reaction, you know, who are they to do this to me and these monkeys and so on and so forth. It really did interfere for some period of time uh, my ability to take seriously some of the questions that people would raise about monkey treatment. Um, you know, and uh, these monkeys also they were all infected with uh, virus B, uh, which 
is a potentially fatal uh, virus to a human being. And there was blood on the floor of those labs uh, that could have been monkey blood or it could have been that person or person's blood. And if that was the case, they might well have been infected with uh, virus B, which is life-threatening. And I, in my anger, uh, though I thought about it, didn't call the ERs in the hospital or around town saying if any, somebody came in with a, you know, a bad slash wound uh, from an animal, to, uh, you know, to at least alert them that that person might, might have been exposed to uh, virus B. I thought about it, but I didn't do it. Uh, Aya Cooks came into existence in the mid-80s, mid-1980s. And, uh, but I, I have to say that uh, I think the general attitude, and I was on that original committee, uh, the, the, the general attitude was, well, where is this coming from? Again, resistance to uh, outside regulation and so on and so forth. And, uh, but there was absolutely no discussion, at, at least at the meetings and none that I ever had with some other members, about what was the historical context that led to this? It was not a topic. It was, here are the rules, here are the expectations, and this is what the committee is supposed to look like uh, in terms of membership, and this is what uh, uh, the, the committee is supposed to do when they're evaluating protocols and so on and so forth. There was no discussion about um, the uh, uh, Historical Animal Welfare Act, uh, instantiation in, the, in 1966 or these major changes that occurred uh, in uh, 1985. It was all more or less we would trudge through what we had to do and that we did it because we were required to do it and so on. I think it was an unfortunate uh, attitude um, because it deprived us of uh, the possibility of appreciating why this circumstance developed. Why was it, why was it felt that self-regulation was inadequate? Um, uh, I think I, like a lot of people, scientists are easily insulted <laughs> when people uh, uh, ask you or tell you, rather, to do things. But, uh, but I have to say that was another very important set of moments when you started going into laboratories where the experiments were being done. I mean, up to that point in time, you know, our laboratory inspections stopped at the laboratory door. And uh, it was uh, an education to see what, what was going behind some of those doors. Uh, the ignorance that was uh, be playing itself out in some, some animal treatment using, you know, wrong analgesic medications and, and uh, uh, in, inappropriate anesthetics for certain kinds of manipulations and so on and so forth. Again, I would say nothing done out of intentions to harm, but out of tradition. This is the way I learned it. This is the way this person's learning it now and doing it and so on. It was... Uh, it was very important. Um, but you know, there was another aspect of those early Aya Cook meetings that I thought, uh, I think may have been lost now. People didn't really know what to do at these meetings. You know, we didn't know exactly what, how to look at these protocols. You know, we had, the, we had some ideas about what we were supposed to expect and for the, on the part of uh, people submitting the protocols and so on and so forth. But we were, um, uh, we were uncertain and uh, just trying to find our way, uh, how to make judgments about protocols and so on and so forth. And, uh, and as a result, I, I, I think on occasion, like an ethical discussion would break out you know, it would, it would just happen. People would you'd realize, hey, we're talking ethics here about cost, benefit, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, 
there was one case that I'll, I, I, I'll know I'll never forget. And it was a young burn surgeon. He was a fellow. And he had put in a protocol to do this burn study on pigs. And uh, the vet at that time had some trouble or problem with some aspects of the procedure and, and had tabled it, had the, uh, the uh, protocol tabled. And um, so the next time it comes up, uh, the protocol comes up to the committee. This uh, young investigator uh, comes into the meeting. He had asked to speak directly to the membership. And uh, he came with the, uh, the chair of surgery. Uh, and anybody that knows about uh, health science centers knows that the chair of surgery is the silverback male of uh, the dominant structure of most medical schools. And uh, so here's the, here's the chair tra traipsing behind, sitting down. And uh, so we're discussing this protocol and uh, burning these pigs and so on. And obviously this researcher is sitting there with, uh, you know, he's got the He's got the, the chief dominant guy right behind him here, and who's going to stand up to him? And uh, out of nowhere, this uh, uh, chair of surgery just says, oh, well, Al, Alan, uh, the, uh, his faculty member, why don't you do this study on yourself? And, uh, and he goes on. He said, look, you could just burn yourself in three or four places on your, on your thigh, on both thighs. You'd have 10 data points. You could try this and you could try, try your intervention on this side and the other on the other. And he said, look, I'll help you uh, get some of the other residents to participate. You know, nobody's going to be terribly scarred. There's just going to be little, you know, three-quarter inch little burn spots on it. And the meeting is just like stops. You know, here's here's a a senior man, a surgeon, um, being of course very paternalistic about he was in charge and how things were going to go on, but he was also coming out of the tradition of self experimentation in in medicine, where that was seen as um, an important aspect of it. That's, that sometimes you did this research on yourself. And uh, as I remember, he, he said, look, you know, uh, you know, Verna Forsman, who got the Nobel Prize for the Forsman catheter, threading these, ca he said, he didn't want to use dogs. So he stood in front of an x-ray machine and threaded the catheter up into his heart, you know, and, and uh, because he thought it was the wrong thing to do to use these dogs, and he, would, it would, he should do the studies on himself. And he said, he got the Nobel Prize. Maybe you'll get that. It was quite a, I, I, I've, I haven't been in a Aya Cook meeting where that degree of freewheeling discussion uh, has happened. I think there's been some very good discussion very often about costs and benefits. And, but um, I think people would be much more careful and uh, uh, less impulsive uh, about saying things like this. I think things are just uh, uh, well organized and uniform and so on and so forth. So I think we miss certain things in uh, I Cook meetings now, and that might be an example of one of them. I think it was 1993 or two when I, um, I had sent a letter to Bernard Rowland at uh, Colorado State because I had read an article that he had published in the American Psychologist. And I thought he was expressing you know, I, what I thought was missing in myself and some of my colleagues and in my, my education and the education of graduate students that I was working with uh, around the topic of ethics. And I um, had a, uh, developed a correspondence with Bernie and uh, he was always 
uh, very available to listen to my naive concerns and so on. But he really did uh, turn me toward, uh, you know, reading some very serious uh, material in ethics as opposed to uh, just being annoyed or concerned. And um, uh, so I found, uh, I was looking around for uh, a place to, to take a sabbatical and uh, get exposed to ethics uh, in a more serious way than I felt like I was able to do as a full-time faculty member with a clinical practice and so on. And uh, I, I told my wife Charlene that I was uh, doing this. I was looking to find a place to get ethics education and uh, she thought it was a very good idea because she knew very well the struggles that I was having at that point. And I looked at the University of Chicago and a couple of other places and then I came across uh, uh, Georgetown, uh, the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown, and they had a visiting fellows program. And uh, I looked at the faculty and um, there was a, uh, a woman there, uh, Barbara Orleans, uh, Flora Barbara Orleans, uh, who had been a, a researcher at NIH and uh, had grown concerned about uh, the treatment of animals in, uh, in her research area. And she had founded uh, the Scientist Center for Animal Welfare. And, uh, and she was at Georgetown, at the Kennedy Institute. And I had read an article by uh, Tom Beecham um, uh, on uh, the moral standing of animals, which I thought was a very inspiring uh, article and written so clearly. I was like, oh, I'm reading a philosopher and I can make sense out of it. <laughs> what uh, this, uh, I can't let this get away. And uh, so I wrote letters to both of them and asked if they would sponsor me as a, as a visiting fellow and they agreed. But I need to tell you that I, you know, so I, I filled out my sabbatical request. I mean, I was due for one. I filled it out submitted it, um, then started to create uh, the separation I needed to go. Well, I get back a letter from the, uh, the committee uh, that made decisions about sabbatical requests, and they said, uh, it said, uh, denied. I said, denied? <laughs> and, uh, so I went to the dean, who, was a, who had been the psychology chair at one point, and I said, Bill, how, how did this get denied? Well, so we both read the letter I received together, and it said basically that the, that the committee didn't see how this, that is studying ethics, uh, was going to benefit the university or my professional work as a researcher and, and clinician. And I thought, so uh, I said, Bill, uh, you got to change this uh, because I, I've already made all the <laughs> arrangements. I'm going, and uh, and I wasn't trying to be uh, you know dominating or threatening or anything. I really wasn't, but I was just so shocked at this whole thing. And he uh, he said, uh, "We'll see that it gets changed." And so he changed it, or made an argument to the committee that he thought it would benefit the university and me and so on and so forth, so it finally got approved. I had an apartment in uh, Roslyn, Virginia, and uh, I walk across the Key Bridge over to Georgetown, and I started walking around the campus, and uh, there's St. Mary's Hall. And so I'm looking at the, uh, the marble inset of Mary, and I notice this, um, this shady place by her folded hands in prayer. So I, I get closer, and it's a bird nest. <laughs> 
sitting behind her hands. And I said to myself, I think I'm at the right place. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, there were, I think, 12 or 13 other fellows. I was the only one doing animal work. There were people from, from uh, the, the Netherlands and, and uh, Japan, and you know, many of them were interested in uh, you know, many healthcare issues, the medical futility, um, uh, end of life concerns, and so on and so forth. But the most powerful th aspect of this uh, initial engagement with the faculty there, Tom and Barbara, and uh, my fellow fellows, was they obviously thought this was a very important thing I was doing. And I, I, I think that I couldn't find very many places where I was at New Mexico where open discussions about animal research or human research, for that matter, in, in an ethical domain were all that acceptable, quite frankly. I felt very often that I was putting people in a position they didn't want to talk about or what have you, or they didn't feel prepared to talk about it or whatever. But. Uh, that, that was the first reaction at Georgetown was, this is where you must talk about it. And uh, um, I mentioned yesterday in my, uh, my talk, uh, one of the people there, was uh, Ed Pellegrino, who is a physician philosopher who um, uh, had these ethics rounds at the hospital and uh, how he wouldn't let you go to those. You know, just to sit in the back and hear an interesting discussion, you had to be ready to answer a question about what was the ethical issue, the medical problem, and how you put this together. And he was like, he said, you know, et doing ethics isn't a hobby. It's part of being a professional. And I think that was the atmosphere at, uh, at Kennedy. And... Uh, uh, Barbara was uh, Barbara and I uh, hit it off right away because we shared uh, a similar history. You know, she was from the UK. Not that I came from the UK, but she came here with uh, certain expectations about how animals are supposed to be treated in research and so on. And and she found that they 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 needed help, and uh, and she became a dis, you know somewhat disaffected about the research process. And then she left NIH. Uh, and so she had a lot of experiences like mine uh, about questions and uh, uncertainties about how to proceed. And, and But I have to tell you this about her. One of the first things she did, she said, uh, you have to know about the animal protection groups. Because if you're going to be trying to influence and learn about people's concerns and influence those concerns, you have to know who these people are. So one day she, uh, she takes me across campus and, and to a, a little mildly run-down Georgetown mansion uh, right off uh, River Road. And so we go in, and it's where the Animal Welfare Institute was housed. And so we, we go into this place, <laughs> surrounded by dogs and, and uh, a couple of them with three legs. And uh, we were there for lunch. And uh, Christine Stevens uh, greeted me. and. Uh, I mean, I, I thought uh, the University of Wisconsin Primate Lab was a family. This was a family group. And we sat down for lunch, a simple lunch of, uh, of bread and vegetables, and people talked about uh, trapping and regulations uh, in treatment of animals and uh, uh, enriching animal lives in laboratories and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, you know, they didn't look like uh, the raving, uh, torturous, uh, murderous uh, uh, images and profiles that I'd uh, 
had actually, you know, uh, I mean, had, like, like we said earlier, had experienced the break in. But uh, these were thoughtful, careful, smart as hell people. I met Kathy Liss, who was uh, who's here now today. Yeah, yeah, I met her the other day at the at the uh, at the lunch table. But and uh, and we uh, and she took me to uh, uh, Barbara took me to other places. I met some people from uh, HSUS, Andrew Rowan, and and. Um, um, some people at PETA she uh, introduced me to and and I thought that was very important because it was you know clearly she was saying you know you, you've got to recognize uh, what is a benefit in these sometimes very harsh attacks and uh, that was just crucial and uh, and for uh, in terms of Tom uh, I mean uh, we we met uh, Two or three hours a week, and uh, uh, you know it's interesting. I I think about one of the, some of the things that Tom provided for me, and still does, is that you know I was a senior faculty member. I thought I knew how to write a paper. <laughs> uh, Tom Beecham is such a sharp intellectual person, and uh, and such a clear voice when he writes about very complicated things. And I think I learned a lot about um, uh, talking and writing about ethics in, in a, a sophisticated way. And I'll, uh, I'll always be uh, thankful for the time that he took with me. And I still, we still maintain a relationship and write together. Um, but uh, he taught me so much about the concept of moral standing uh, the history of uh, the st uh, personhood as a, as a set of criteria for standing and the weaknesses of that uh, particular position. Um, uh, it was, uh, and, th and then the people, uh, the other fellows, and the faculty, the courses that I could go to, and listening to Ed Pellegrino. And, um, I mean, I, I'm sure there are other very important places where people can study ethics, uh, but uh, this was like nothing I'd experienced in my entire educational life. You know, it was uh, people devoted to teaching and uh, the openness to explore ethical questions without reproach. Um, what a time that was. Yeah, what's, what, what's the uh, resistance that researchers have to uh, perhaps engaging as they, that would benefit them in their work and, and certainly would benefit the animals? Uh, you know, the, uh, the psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton uh, talks about doubling the ability to compartmentalize and and um, you know issues that are problematic in terms of your work and life from areas uh, that would appear on on the surface to be coherently ethically uh, integrated and um, I know that's more of just a description rather than a meaningful explanation but I think it does capture us because I think as because I know that was one of the attributes I felt I had to learn as a as a uh, an animal researcher was was to compartmentalize, and uh, it failed uh, at some point, and uh, and I would I would uh, suggest that I think it wasn't a complete um, blockage for me because of uh, the people I grew up with and uh, and. Uh, the veterinarian, but particularly Brett Snyder, that uh, that talked with me and you know found a way to uh, talk about issues that were so important to a more general sense of uh, holding a mirror up to your own activities. Um, I think uh, a lot of uh, th there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fear in in researchers uh, that I interact with today. Uh, some of it I 
I suppose is uh, understandable uh, that they fear uh, reprisals uh, if some of their work was done, uh, known, uh, the work that they do was known. Uh, I think there's been a, a tarring of uh, animal welfare groups uh, with the terrorist brush uh, to an extent that I think is undeserved. I'm sure there are people out there who are dangerous and, and uh, want to hurt us. Uh, but I don't think there are that many. I really don't. Uh, we had a, an experience in New Mexico, uh, the student animal law group in the law school invited Peter Young, a man who released a bunch of minks in Wisconsin and uh, was tracked by the FBI for several years. And I think he was uh, in federal prison for three years. And they had invited him to talk about basically being prosecuted under the animal terrorist legislation. Uh, parts of the university tried to block that. Uh, they, they tried to block it. Like, you're not talking about that on this campus. And, and of course, I reflected back being a student at University of Wisconsin between 1968 and 1971. You went to the student union building and uh, the Black Panthers were talking over here and SDS was talking over there and, you know, the, you know it was just this wide open kind of uh, uh, expose yourself to radical thought is, uh, and it was seen as like, almost like it was necessary. And here was this attempt to keep, anyhow, they failed. And, and he came, unfortunately, not many researchers showed up, a few did. And, um, you know, and you could see his desire to change the way animals are perceived culturally and, and for entertainment and dress and agriculture and so on and so forth. It was very, he was very committed to this. And, uh, you know, some of his connections seemed a little shaky to me personally, but, but he wasn't, he was wasn't crazy. Um, I remember a few years ago I read this book, uh, Kamikaze Diaries, and it's a book of diaries of written by kamikaze pilots during World War II. And it was like, you probably think a kamikaze is about as crazy as you could possibly become as a soldier. And you read these diaries, these were men who were really struggling with what they were doing and the, the rightfulness or wrongfulness and the f fears that they had and the push they felt, you know, to act out in a cultural way. I mean, these weren't crazy people. And neither was, neither was Peter Young. I think there was a lot to learn from listening to Peter Young. Um, uh, so I think, I think uh, one of the reasons is that I think our administrations in universities keep us separated, keep we as researchers separated, I think, uh, from some of these kinds of influences. And I think they're probably doing it because I think it's better for us and we'll be more productive for it and so on and so forth. But there, it's a losing proposition to me. It's a losing proposition. You know, you know, the the Institute of Medicine committee on the on the uh, the necessity of chimpanzees in biomedical research. Here you had a committee made up of scientists, one ethicist, Jeff Kahn, from Hopkins, and what happened there? That committee became ethically sophisticated. Now, I would bet most of those people wouldn't have walked 100 yards to an ethics lecture. But here's Jeff Kahn. He's thrust in there. They're thrust in there with him. Kahn is a smart guy, a PhD from one of Tom Beecham's PhDs. And, you know, there was an environment where that kind of discussion was accepted and open and encouraged. And there was a tremendous change that many of those committee members experienced. I used this phrase yesterday about starting points for uh, 
perhaps changing uh, many researcher attitude towards, towards ethics. And uh, the phrase I used, and I'm, I'm sure it's not mine, I'm sure I'm borrowing it or stealing it from somebody else, and it was, at least in terms of that ethics education in, uh, in science education has to be something really substantial. Um, and it's not. I mean, I think in some places it might be, but it's not uh, in general. It seems fairly superficial. So NIH requires, uh, what is it, eight hours of research integrity, uh, training for people on certain kinds of training grants and so on and so forth. Well, at least they, they're saying you should be doing this, having some discussion about research integrity. But you basically have 12 subjects being dealt with in eight hours, you know, Maybe some places expand that to some extent, but that's the, that's the minimum. Well, you know, I, 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 th this has to do with not just knowing about compliance and you know, how to do things right and you know, by the law and the regulations, as important as that is, and it is important. Uh, you need something, you need more time where, uh, where you can hold up a mirror to yourself as a human being and ask questions about, do you have a goal for a moral identity? Do I want to, do I want to be a moral person and what does that mean? You know, it's kind of like what Ed Pellegrino used to say all the time, ethics isn't a hobby, it's about coming to grips with your moral identity. And, uh, I think it's tough outside of that possibility to, of having that kind of open educational experience and people who are capable of doing it. Um, in the 19th century, who, who would give an ethics lecture at a university? It would be the university president because they wanted, you would want the most uh, highly revered person to be teaching ethics. And now it seems to me to be gravitating to uh, a much more, um, uh, who's willing to do it? Anybody here willing to take on this course? And, and, uh, and there's some people who take it on and they mean it and they work damn hard with it. But I think uh, there's not a lot of room for it in, uh, in, um, in science education. So we have to get the PH back in the PhD, as I said yesterday. After all, we were supposed to be philosophers as well uh, to get these advanced degrees in medicine and, and science. Um, I think absent that, uh, I, I think we're going to be pretty mediocre.